Look with me to Romans chapter 8. We're going to pick up um, chapter 8 in, in verse 9. And uh, so tonight we're going to look at verses 9 through 17. Paul writing to the church at Rome here. And he's talking about being led by the Spirit. And of course, I forgot my reading glasses, so we're going to have to go a little bit slow tonight. It says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of us. And if Christ be in you, the holy body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Now again tonight I've broken this up with some key things I'd like to pull out. Again, this is, not, this is not real deep, but it is sort of deep. First thing I want us to look at tonight is empowered spiritual living. This is going to cover verses 8 through 11. It's going to get probably what's the end of your first pause in chapter 8. Empowered spiritual living. When Paul says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, we receive the Holy Spirit when we are born again. Now, have you ever had a conversation with somebody that may be from another religion or from another cult about the moment of inception of the Holy Spirit? There are some that believe, like we do, that you get everything you need at the moment of salvation. There are some that believe you don't get the Holy Spirit until you've passed through the baptismal waters. There are some that believe you don't get the Holy Spirit until the first time you speak in tongues or do some sort of physical thing like that. We as Baptists teach, as Paul does, that we receive it when we're born again. It gives us a principle higher and more powerful than the flesh. It's something that the flesh cannot give us. When he says also in verse 8, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his, meaning Christ, every believer has the Holy Spirit. But we can't be split into a Spirit-filled and not spirit-filled category. We can't say, I'm, I'm a child of God, but I'm not spirit-filled. Those two things just don't go together. If you are not spirit-filled, obviously you are not Christian. But, how does one know that they have the Spirit? How do you know that you are, in fact, spirit-filled? Has the Spirit led you to Jesus? The Bible says you must be drawn. Has that happened? Has the Spirit put, you, put in you the desire to honor God? Do you have desires other than of this world that is to please Jesus? Is the Spirit leading you to be more like Jesus? We ought to be changing, evolving, working that out. Is the Spirit at work in your heart? Those are some questions that will lead you to know whether you have or do not have the Spirit. Verse 10, he says, And if the Spirit of Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. A lot of these times I'll read these out of a different translation, so it may not be exactly King James. If the Spirit of Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. When Jesus lives in us, the old body is dead. We have become a new creation. We're not like we used to be. The Spirit should live and reign in us, and will live out His salvation even through our mortal bodies through His resurrection. Even though we are still mortal, even though we still are born of that sin nature, we're new. We've got that Holy Spirit indwelling in us, in us to empower us to spiritual living. The second point tonight is verses 12 and 13, which is spiritual debt. Paul says we are debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh in verse 12. 
The flesh gave us nothing good. Now that's going to be contrary to what you may hear in society today. But the flesh didn't give us anything. It just gave us basic life. We should not indulge or, or pamper that flesh. And this is a narrow sense of sinful flesh in rebellion against God. Not everything done in the body is bad, but if it's done without Jesus, it's a sinful flesh rebelling against a holy God. Our allegiance, our debt, is to God, not the flesh. A great example of that would be if you were to be persecuted. We don't know what persecution is. A lot of times I use the example, if we go up and put our money in the Coca-Cola machine and we hit the Dr. Pepper button and something diet comes out, that's the extent of our persecution. Or maybe somebody may make fun of us for being a church boy or a church girl. That's persecution. Or they may, they may mock us because we pray over our food. We don't really know what persecution is if we, until we start studying what's going on in the globe around us today. The fact that we owe the Spirit, not the flesh, if we were to be put in a position that our life could be taken from us by accepting or denying Jesus Christ, that's feeding the Spirit, not the flesh. That's when God says, you need to do this, yet the Spirit wants us to do that, and we obey the Spirit. That's being in debt to the Spirit, not in debt to the flesh. Paul says in verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Now Paul reminds us time and again that living after the flesh ends in death. It's one of those things that they say repetition is good for a young, growing, evolving mind. This reminder is needed as life tends to speak to us all the wondrous appearances of the flesh. The world says, you don't want to give your life to Christ right now because you can't live, because you can't laugh, because you can't love, because you can't have all the things that this world has to offer. The flesh is lying to us, the world is lying to us in that respect. This reminder is needed as sometimes we forget and think that flesh offers us life. We get our priorities out of whack sometimes. We're living for the now instead of the living for the hereafter. Verse 13, Paul also says, By the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, when we put to death the deeds of the body. Only through the Spirit can we put to death the deeds of the body. The flesh is strong. I know it's not supposed to be that way, but it is. That, that little uh, angel sitting on one side trying to tell you what to do and the little devil on the other side, we want to hear the, the great things of life. We don't want to hear the doing what somebody else wants us to do. And we have to put that to death with the Spirit. The body cannot do it. It's not strong enough. Otherwise, spiritual proudness of the Pharisees will rule the day. Remember, remember how the Pharisees um, had their hand on the pulse? and they were making money, and they were glorified in and of themselves, and they were really big guys, and they were a really big thing, and Jesus came in, and they meant nothing. They didn't like that. That was pride. That was all of the flesh. And even though Jesus was showing them miracles and showing them signs and telling them He was the way, the truth, and the life, they could not hear it because they were playing to their flesh. They were important in their own mind, in their own right. They had worked themselves to a position there were nobody could come to the temple unless they were satisfied through them. Verses 14 and 15 is our third point, spiritual living as a child of God. In verse 14, Paul says, these are the sons of God. Now being the sons and the daughters of God, we should be led by God. Being a son or a daughter of God leads to being spiritually led. Not physically led, not emotionally led, not thought-led, but spirit-led. One of my commentators, Gizek, said this, Paul didn't say as many as go to church, these are the sons of God. He didn't say as many as read their Bibles, these are the sons of God. He didn't say as many as are patriotic Americans, these are the sons of God. He didn't say as many as take communion, these are the sons of God. In this text, the test for sonship is whether or not a person is led by the Spirit of God. So, how does the Holy Spirit lead us? Four things, three things. Number one, we are led by guidance. And it's just straightforward, that path that we're to walk on. Number two, we're led by drawing. 
that's pulling us into a certain direction. And thirdly, we're led by a governing authority, which is God's Word. Spurgeon had this to say, We are led as we cooperate with the leading. It does not say as many as are driven by the Spirit of God. No, the devil is a driver. And when he enters either into men or into hogs, he drives them furiously. Remember how the whole herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. Whenever you see a man fanatical and wild, whatever spirit is in him, it is not the Spirit of Christ. Now, poor old Brother Spurgeon, he could just lay it down and let it lay where it was. But if you think about it, when Jesus cast the demons out of the man into the herd of swine, they ran violently down the hill. Now, we know some folks that run violently about it, and it makes you want to wonder. Where does the Holy Spirit lead us? Not just how does it, but where does it? Six things. Number one, He leads us to repentance. That's key. We have to be led of the things that are wrong in our life to repent of them. He leads us to think little of self and much of Jesus. If you were to prioritize your life as far as the things that you're thankful for, how far up that list would Jesus be? He leads us into truth. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead us into a lie. He's not going to lead us to something that contradicts His Word. He leads us into love like we talked about this morning. You can't have love one for another without Christ in you. He leads us into holiness. Not perfection, but holiness. Holiness through Jesus Christ. And He leads us into usefulness. He gives us and equips us the abilities to do things for God that make us useful. In verse 15 He says, For, did, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. We should not have fear and bondage in our relationship with God. Now, Paul a lot of times talked about how he was a bond servant, meaning that he willingly put himself into servitude. And that's what we do when we give our life to Christ. We're not forced into bondage with Christ. We willingly give ourselves over to that. We should have an intimate, joyful relationship with God. We should be so close that we can cry, Abba, Father, as in verse 15. Paul says we can cry out, Abba, Father. It's easy to imagine the relationship of Jesus to God. They're two independent, one in the same entities, the third being the Holy Spirit. But why is it so hard for us to realize that we have that same relationship through Jesus Christ? In Christ, we have the privilege of relating to the Father even as Jesus Christ does. You can call out Father. Abba Father. God, I need some help. God, I need a touch. God, you reign supreme in my life. One lesson writer, Bruce, wrote this. In the Roman world of the first century, an adopted son was a son deliberately chosen by his adoptive father to propitiate his name and inherit his estate. He has no wit inferior in status to a son born in the ordinary course of nature. They get a part. They get a portion just like naturally born. Gizek said this, Under Roman adoption, the life and standing of the adopted child changed completely. The adopted son lost all rights in his old family and gained all new rights in his new family. The old life of the adoption son was completely wiped out with all debts being canceled, with nothing from his past counting against him anymore. And that's how we're adopted by Jesus. We're wiped clean and brought in new. Verse 16, number 4, our, our fourth point, the witness of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, The Spirit Himself bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God. And a lot of times, I know Billy's not here to testify to this, but a lot of times, or Brother Jeff, when we have to sit down with somebody and they're doubting their salvation, this is one thing we have to go back to. The Spirit bears witness to you that you either are or you are not. Those who belong to God know it based on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You just know. There's been a time we can go back to where you gave your life to the Lord, what was changed in your life, how have you seen a change in your life, how are you growing, how are you being led but some wrongfully identify based on the indwelling 
of the wrong spirits. Some mistake the indwelling based on the fog of life that is allowed to overshadow the miracle of God in their life. I tell folks, if you're not growing with God, if you're not following God and working for God in obedience to Him, you're not growing, you're, you're going to start doubting because you're not moving forward. We say we're going to do something and we never do it. We're going to start doubting. Can we really actually do that? The witness of the Spirit will always rule the situations of doubt. But you have to be identified that the Spirit is in you. Verse 16, he says, we are children of God. We should not have any doubt we are His children. Now, I know that's a hard statement to make. And I've personally, in my life, I've, I've dealt with that doubt. But it was because I was not fully surrendered to where God wanted me to be. And once I started surrendering to where God wanted me to be, and I started seeing God move in my life, those doubts started fading away. Now I know that I know that I know. And when I talk to folks that are doubting their salvation, I ask them, what are you doing for God? How are you serving Jesus? And we start peeling that onion off. We shouldn't have doubts. We should know and live accordingly. And we should understand and enjoy the benefits of family identification. Just like back in the Roman time, when you adopted a child, their life was wiped out and they were brought new and they were identified as new. That's what we ought to be enjoying is the benefits of of the family of Jesus Christ. By saying, this is not our home. There's going to come a time when we're going to leave this place and go be with the Father in heaven. And we want to tell as many people as we can so they can enjoy those benefits also. Now, again, you can lead that horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You can hold them underwater for a little while, but you, know, you can't force it on somebody. But if you don't at least lead them and tell them where it's at, they're not going to know, right? <clears throat> Lastly, number five, talking in verse 17, we have the responsibilities and benefits of the children of God. In verse 17, Paul says, And if children, then heirs. The privilege of relating to God as Jesus does. We have an inheritance. Our inheritance is not a matter of doing, but a matter of being in the right family. How many of you remember when we used to go through faith visitation and we would say, forsaking all, I trust Him. That, that, that H stood for heaven. And you remember where heaven was? Heaven was here as well as hereafter. Now I know it's hard to imagine heaven being here, but that peace that passes all understanding, that communion that we have with God, that leading and that drawing of the Holy Spirit, that's something that people that don't know Christ don't understand now my parents had told me that when something happens to them then I will inherit this or then I will have that and there was a time delay I knew it was going to be mine maybe but I had to wait when you give your life to Christ you enjoy that inheritance now it's not a wait till later even though the best is yet to come we start enjoying those benefits now but in verse 17 he says, if indeed we suffer with Him. Now since we're in Christ, we're also going to suffer with Christ. It's not a bed of roses, as Mama used to say. It's not just a once and done thing. It's going to be some struggles, but God will get you through it. As God's children, we're not going to be immune from trials and from suffering. Those things are going to come in our life like we talked about this morning, but it's so that we can be so that we can be grown, so that we can grow closer. Anyone who says being a children of God has no problems is not of God's Spirit. I watch a lot of guys, people send me links and emails, and, and not all of them are guys, but they send me links and emails and things about people to watch. Watch this person. Some is because it is, in fact, a good message. Some is, see if you can see what I see in this. There are some people that only want to teach the good. They want to teach everything is great. You give your life to Jesus. Your grass will never be mowed. Your gas tank will never run out. You know, there will always be bread in the cabinet. God's going to bless His folks. God's going to bless His own. Well, like I said, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, to be certified, you have to take a test. And to stay certified, you have to be retested. 
Sometimes that faith needs to be tested. It's not just to see just what we're made of, it's so others can see what God does in us. If indeed we suffer with Him, Paul goes on to say, that we may also be glorified together. Sharing in present suffering is a condition of our future glorification. Sometimes it's a cost, but it's a glorious cost. As far as God is concerned, it's all part of the same package of sonship. No matter how much our flesh may want to have the inheritance and the glory without the suffering, it's part of it. As I was studying for this, my mind went to Job. You remember the story of Job? Um, they didn't lock the door quick enough, and the guys kept coming in, telling them all the catastrophes, and finally his children were gone, and Job had went and, and, and uh, sat down in the ashes and, and, and poured ashes and sackcloth, and he was in grieving and mourning, and naked I came and naked I also go, and his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Just imagine, covered in so sores, and Job said this, he said, You speak, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. In other words, Job said, If God allowed this to happen, God's got a plan. God's going to be glorified through this. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about how can we glorify God. Now that's, that's saying a lot. I don't, I don't want to have to go through the trials and tests that Job went through. But if all we talk about is the good, then we're not prepared for the bad. When you teach a man or a woman how to run a machine, you have to talk about what happens when something goes wrong. You have to know where the off button is. You have to know where the disconnect is. You have to know where the fire extinguisher is. You have to know where the exit is. When you're cooking in the kitchen, you've got to know what to put on what kind of fire and which window to flip it out of. You have to be prepared for those things in life. But on the flip side, if all we talk about is the bad, then we're not enjoying the benefits of the good. At the darkest times, at the lowest times, when, you, when, you, when you've gone as far as you think you can go, do you not hear that still, small voice speaking to you? Do you not have a brother or sister slide up beside you and say, Hey, I'm here. What can I do? Do you not have those times when the Spirit makes intercession for the groans that we make in prayer? Paul is teaching us to be led by the Spirit. How much different would our world be if the Christians were as loud as the non-Christians? How much different would our world be if those that spoke for Christ were as vocal as those that protested against anything to do with Christ? How much different would it be if everybody called by my name, humbled themselves, God said, and prayed, and are led by the Spirit? Let's pray.